Good morning, distinguished leaders of the Semmelweis University, Professor Papp, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is a great pleasure to return to Semmelweis University, um, and I want to acknowledge Professor Papp, who continues the legacy of Semmelweis as a former vice rector and chair of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. This is a picture that we took in the office of the rector a few years ago, and I'm proud to say that not only Sultan, but uh, accompanying us are Professor Chervenak and Professor Kuryak. And uh, here is a picture of Professor Pab, Valeria, and my wife, who is of Hungarian origin. Her name is Sable. Infection is the greatest killer of human history. Think about the bubonic plague, tuberculosis, malaria. Even today, infection remains the greatest killer in human history. Infection is the third cause of maternal death today. The first one is hemorrhage, the second hypertension, but the third remains infection. The story of poor childbed fever is told in this book, The Tragedy of Childbed Fever. And I won't repeat what others have said today, more eloquent and more learned what I can do today. But I think succinctly the similar observations of Ignaz Semmelweis is one, that childbed fever was transmissible. He proposed an ideology that preceded the germ theory of disease and implemented prophylaxis. He changed obstetrics and improved the outlook for mothers and their families. And I think it's fitting to remember Ignaz Semmelweis and to give this tribute today as he did not live long enough to see worldwide transcendence of the importance of his discovery, along with the acclaim and recognition that he deserves. I work in the problem of infection, infection during pregnancy. And I told you infection is the third cause of maternal death. But the leading cause of infant mortality worldwide is prematurity. Well, it turns out that one of every three preterm babies is born to a mother who has intraamniotic infection that is totally subclinical. Mothers don't have a fever and the only manifestation of those infections is premature onset of labor. Today, rather than looking back, I'd like to tell you a look to the future and the recent discoveries in clinical chorioamnionitis at term. This is the most common infection-related complication in labor and delivery units around the world. It is believed that all women have microorganisms in the lower genital tract, and those microorganisms find their way to the amniotic cavity. The mothers develop a systemic inflammatory response that is characterized by the presence of fever and of the signs. An intrapartum fever is actually the most common complication in any labor and delivery unit. How common? It is a function of the duration of labor. And if a patient is in labor for 18 hours, 23% of women will have a fever. The consequences of this fever and infection includes the development of pelvic adhesions. This is the uterus, these are the adhesions, and they may be cause of secondary infertility. Often, if a patient has a cesarean section, 
the bacteria gets into the wound and this is a wound infection after a cesarean delivery. Persistent fevers can cause septic pelvic thrombophlebitis. Here is a thrombus in the pelvis. This is an angiogram that needs to be treated with heparin in addition to antibiotics. And here is a uterus and this is air because organisms can form air and this can be a cause of a very severe infection, postpartum endometritis. Now, if the mothers have an intramniotic infection, the babies are at risk for infection, and this is a baby clearly at term that is critically ill because of acquiring a congenital early neonatal sepsis. Now, what do we do today when a mother develops a fever in labor and delivery? Well, this condition, clinical chorioamnionitis, has been neglected. This study, performed in the United States 30 years ago, addressed a very simple question. If a patient, a mother has a fever, should she receive antibiotics immediately, or should we wait for the baby to be delivered to do a culture and then treat the baby? This randomized clinical trial took women who have clinical chorioamnionitis, so a fever. There were only 48 patients randomized to receive antibiotics as soon as the fever occurred, or to wait until the baby was delivered. The antibiotics given are listed here, but the trial was stopped after 48 patients by the Data and Safety Monitoring Committee. And it was stopped because the patients who received antibiotics when the women were in labor had no sepsis, but the rate of neonatal sepsis was 41% if antibiotics were not given in the antenatal period. The rate of pneumonia was zero if the antibiotics were given before. In labor, 32% if they were given after delivery. And because of this, the trial was stopped. Now, this was published in 1988. 30 years later, this is the standard management of clinical chorioamnionitis. So antibiotics should be given in the intrapartum period. Now, the consequences of this are that when the babies are treated in utero with antibiotics, they are born not necessarily infected because not all babies get infected, and they frequently have this, that is an arterial puncture, and look at this over here in the mouth of the baby, because this is a very painful procedure, and sometimes they have a lumbar puncture. We have reasons to believe that in at least 40% of the cases, these procedures are unnecessary. So what is new? in clinical chorioamnionitis. Well, we have published a disease that has been neglected for 30 years. We have published these papers, and I am not going to torture you with all these papers. I'm gonna give you the highlights. First, if a mother has a fever in labor, tachycardia, fetal or maternal, how frequent is an infection? Well, a proven infection with molecular and culture techniques is present in 54% of patients. There is a second group, here are the bacteria, there is a second group that has intramniotic inflammation but has no microorganisms by culture or molecular microbiologic techniques. We call this sterile intramniotic inflammation. And I often say this is similar to a gout. Gout, gout is caused by urate crystals in the joints, but there is inflammation, but there is no bacteria. And we have demonstrated that there are danger signals, no urate crystals in the amniotic cavity causing this inflammation. And yet there is a cell group of mothers who have a fever, but do not have inflammation and infection. 
a very interesting group that I will discuss in a moment. The most common microorganisms that we found in the amniotic cavity are not the ones causing puerperal fever in the Semmelweis era. The most common organisms are ureoplasma species. Up to 80% of normal pregnant women have these organisms in the lower genital tract. And there is no point in looking for them because they are normally present. And the problem is that in most women, these organisms are here, and in a few, they transit into the amniotic cavity. The frequency of infection is different if the membranes are intact over here. Infection is present in 25% of women who have a fever in labor, but if the membranes are ruptured, the frequency of infection is 70%. Now, but what about the clinical diagnosis? This is how we make the clinical diagnosis today. Fever is a requirement, and then we need two or more of this. Well, these criteria are equivalent to flipping a coin. So the clinical signs are not enough to diagnose intramniotic infection. How frequently are the fetuses infected? Because it's one thing to have bacteria in the amniotic fluid, is another one for the fetus to be infected. The fetus get infected because they are breathing amniotic fluid and they are swallowing bacteria. In this study, and I'm not going to ask you to read all of this, there were 6,000 deliveries. 6% 6 of mothers have a fever, but the frequency of early neonatal sepsis was 0.07%. In our unit, where we know for sure, because we have done amniocentesis, the frequency of fit or neonatal sepsis is between four and six percent. What are the problems, the practical problems, that affect the women in Budapest and the world with the most common complication of labor? Neonatologists do not search for the most frequent microorganisms that cause intrauterine infection, urioplasma species. And the neonatal attack rate is, in my view, underestimated because bacteremias are not constant, the blood volume for culture is small, and infection can be present with a negative culture. How to diagnose intramniotic infection? By looking at the amniotic fluid, this is the gold standard, doing molecular techniques and culture, including genital mycoplasmas, or examining the presence of intramniotic inflammation. That requires an invasive approach, performing an amniocentesis that is risky. So with the team at the University of South Korea, Professor Jung, we have developed a method, a catheter, that is applied against the cervix that allows collection of amniotic fluid and then assessing the presence of infection by analysis of amniotic fluid. And we have developed a method whereby in 10 minutes we can determine if a patient has intramniotic inflammation or not. And what is the importance of this? That if a patient doesn't have intramniotic inflammation, it is unlikely that that baby will require antibiotics. Now, before I change subjects, I should tell you that one of the most, up to 80% of nulli gravidas have an epidural during labor for the relief of pain. And 10 to 20% of those patients develop a fever. And those fevers are of neural origin. They are largely unrelated to infection. So we have all these pregnant women who are receiving antibiotics. The babies are receiving antibiotics and having invasive procedures to exclude infection. And many of these are, in my view, unnecessary. So that is what I why I believe that a non-invasive approach is required. What about antimicrobial agents? Because this affects the practice of medicine in the entire world. 
the antimicrobial agents that we use are ampicillin, gentamicin, and clindamycin. None of these antibiotics touch the organism more frequently involved in intramniotic infection that are ureoplasmas. So antibiotics that we administer to mothers with clinical choreomyelitis are largely ineffective against ureoplasma. Cultures and tests for detecting ureoplasmas are not performed by neonatologists and the antibiotics that are given to neonates we suspect the sepsis do not cover these organisms. And this is where we are today. So I wanted to show you this article published two years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, in which women undergoing cesarean deliveries were given standard antibiotics, but in addition were given acetromycin, that is an antibiotic that can cover ureoplasmas. The frequency of endometritis and wound infections, looking at the mother, was lower in patients who were given acetromycin compared to those who were given placebo. So there is an intervention that we can use, and this is about to become standard of practice. So I wanted to share it with you, because it may affect your practice here. So among women undergoing non-elective cesarean deliveries, that means that we're in labor, those who receive standard antibiotic prophylaxis with acetromycin, these women were less likely to have infection than those who receive no acetromycin. Now to close, because I have focused on the problem of the mothers, I'd like to say two things about the fetus. Um, this is a normal chest x-ray. You can see the neonatal lungs. And this is a white, white lungs because these babies have meconium aspiration syndrome. Meconium is fetal stool. 10% of patients in labor have meconium. But of those, only a very small fraction have this syndrome, and typically this happens in labor at term. And it has been a mystery why, if 10% of mothers have meconium in the amniotic fluid, the rate of meconium aspiration syndrome, that is a very severe condition, is so rare. Well, here is evidence that patients who have clinical choreomyonitis at term are more likely to have meconium aspiration syndrome the patients who do not have clinical choreomyonitis. And we have this new theory that I want to share with you today. All women have microorganisms in the lower genital tract. These microorganisms, when the membranes are intact or rupture, can get access to the amniotic fluid. When a baby is in labor, one of the things it does is to stop breathing. And this is because it produces prostaglandins suppress fetal breathing. But babies do swallow in utero, and they can swallow. These are neutrophils giving an inflammatory reaction, but the babies can swallow these organisms that go to the stomach, they can go to the bowel, and then the fetuses may have in utero diarrhea, and that's the reason why we have meconium in the amniotic cavity. Now, if those fetuses do breathe contaminated amniotic fluid, then this is what happens. They develop, first of all, the bacteria goes into the lung, and then the fetus is red because it has developed a systemic inflammatory response syndrome. So what happened in the lung is, number one, the fetus aspirates meconium, which is fetal stool. The meconium blocks the airway and induces local inflammation. And then because the fetus has a systemic inflammatory response, it has the equivalent of acute respiratory distress syndrome. And that is what I think is responsible for meconium aspiration syndrome. Now what evidence do we have 
to support this. Here is the frequency of meconium aspiration syndrome when mothers have no intramniotic inflammation, no fetal systemic inflammation. If the pregnancy has intramniotic inflammation, the frequency of meconium aspiration syndrome is only 10%. But if both intramniotic inflammation and fetal systemic inflammation is present, the frequency of meconium aspiration syndrome is nearly 30%. We published this two years ago, but it links infection, inflammation in the amniotic cavity, and in the human fetus. So I'd like to conclude, and I have one more story to tell you, by saying that clinical chorioamnionitis is, heterogeneous, is a heterogeneous condition. Not every mother with a fever has infection. 20% of mothers do not have infection, do not have inflammation. Often, they have an epidural-induced fever and not necessarily infection. Of those who have a fever, 65% will have an intramniotic infection. We have a group of patients who have intra, sterile intramniotic inflammation, and there is a group that has this epidural-induced fever. The fetal attack rate increases when there is intramniotic infection and is approximately 4 to 6%. And maternal and umbilical core cytokines do not differentiate between the two. And consideration needs to be given to identify the neonate at risk for mycoplasmas. So to close, I want to show you this baby. This baby cannot move the lower extremities. He has problems of posture, as you can see. This baby has cerebral palsy. This baby was born at term. Prematurity is the leading cause of cerebral palsy, particularly when there is intramniotic infection. But this baby, born at term to a mother with clinical chorioamnionitis, is a baby born in South Korea. Cannot move the lower extremities, has problems with posture. And uh, there is now very compelling evidence that maternal fever of more than 38 degrees is associated with an increased risk of unexplained cerebral palsy, and the odds ratio is nine, so roughly nine times. One or more indicators of maternal infection were present in 22% of babies who have cerebral palsy at term. So we all believe that the problem is neonatal sepsis, but those babies with fever that go home may have neuroinflammation that is undiagnosed because it's silent. They go home, probably partially treated, and they're at risk for cerebral palsy. One or more indicators of maternal infection were present in 37% of babies who have spastic quadriplegic subtype of cerebral palsy, and the odds ratio is nearly 20. A maternal infection was also linked to low APGAR scores and other evidence of hypotension and the need for resuscitation and neonatal seizures. Thank you very much for your attention, Professor Papp. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here.